have word, won't have word probably till tomorrow or the next day about how many people have signed up, but I've been notified by about 10 people who have uh, signed up for the Egypt trip, so I don't know how many more than that uh, have signed up, so that's, that's a good start. Okay, so those are the first two announcements. The others are men's prayer breakfast and deacons meeting will uh, be on May 18th. We begin at 7.30, so that's a good time for men to come and to uh, get to know each other and be involved uh, talking about the Word of God that on those mornings. Camp Arete is coming up this summer, July 14th to 20th. You can get information at camparete.com. And also Vacation Bible School, July 8th through 10th. Now, we do need some volunteers to help out both with Vacation Bible School as well as uh, some Sunday school teachers. Now, this Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m., there will be a memorial service here at the church. So we need some of the deacons to be here to help out with various things. But also Thursday night after class, we're going to need some men to help uh, set up tables out in the fellowship hall. There'll be... Uh, a luncheon after the memorial service on on Saturday. So uh, be prepared to help out a little bit on on Thursday. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer as usual to make sure that we are spiritually prepared, cleansed, in right relationship with the Lord, walking by the Spirit, abiding in Christ, walking in the light, living our spiritual life in intimacy with the Father and when we sin, that is broken, but when we admit our sin, acknowledge it to God, then at that instant we are forgiven of those sins and then cleansed of all unrighteousness and restored to that intimate rapport that we can enjoy with the Father. So after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're indeed grateful that we can come before your throne of grace this evening, that we can come to bring our, some petitions before you as we did in prayer meeting. Father, we pray for uh, those in this congregation who are facing uh, various illnesses. Some are just ongoing, debilitating health problems. Others are perhaps life-threatening. Uh, we have a number of people whose circumstances have have become serious within the last week. We pray for them and for their caregivers and for their families that they might be a testimony of your grace, your goodness, and your the way you sustain us in times of difficulty. Father, we do pray, as we're told in Scripture, for our nation, for our government, for our leaders, that we may be able to live our lives in peace and that we may be able to carry out the mission that you've given us without fear or dread of government interference. And Father, we know that all too often there is government interference and involvement in uh, carrying out your word. And Father, we do pray for the situation that has arisen with Chafer Seminary in relation to the Department of Education in New Mexico. And we pray that you would give the board and the leaders at Chafer wisdom and skill in how they handle that particular situation, as uh, serious as it is. And Father, we continue to pray for each of us in this congregation, that we might keep our focus upon you, that we might be reminded that we are to walk closely with you. That means that we are to live out our spiritual life conscientiously and intentionally throughout each day, that we need to internalize your word day in and day out, because there is a time coming perhaps in each of our lives in this nation when we will face serious and significant opposition uh, for our stand for biblical truth. And the only thing that will sustain us is that, that, that relationship that we have developed 
in times of peace, in times of prosperity uh, with you, knowing that you are our bulwark, our fortress, our shield, our high tower. You are the one who sustains us and strengthens us. And Father, we look forward to your work in our lives and encouraging us with what we learned tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Open your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and looking at David's thanksgiving uh, prayer to God as he has come to face the reality of what God has done for him. Uh, this is a significant thing that God has done for David. It's one of the most significant things that takes place in the Old Testament, I think second only to the Abrahamic covenant for what God has promised an individual and the way he will bless that individual. And it has nothing to do with who David was, what David did. Uh, David committed many egregious sins. And as I pointed out when we got into this study, as we were looking at the verse-by-verse -verse options in 2 Samuel chapter 7, is that the way the writer of Samuel uh, organizes the material is not chronologically. Within the sections, there's chronology, but uh, he organizes the first part to show how God blessed David throughout his life. Then he talks about David's failures. That will begin when we get into chapter, uh, chapter 11. And uh, as I pointed out at the beginning of chapter 7, it has the statement, Now it came to pass... When the king was dwelling in his house, so by that time he had built his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. And if we look at the beginning of chapter 8, we see that he is attacked by the Philistines and he subdues them. And there's a long list which we'll basically summarize when we get there next week of the uh, fights, the wars that he has with the uh, with the Philistines, with the Am Am Ammonites, that's the Jordanians today, uh, with the Arameans, that's the Syrians today, uh, with those in Moab, those in Edom, uh, those will be uh, all of these wars. So either the Bible is contradicting itself by saying that the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies in 7-1, and then in chapters eight and nine, we see the wars going on, and even into 10, the reality is that, that these are taken out of order. And so it is near the end of his life that God gives him this covenant. And this is why he is so amazed, because this doesn't come before the sin with Bathsheba, the conspiracy to murder Uriah the Hittite, her husband and his friend and one of his mighty men. And, and, uh, and later there's the, all the sins involved in his family, all the things that they do, the rebellion of his son Absalom, and all of these things that take place. It is after that, and in spite of the fact that, that he has uh, been this uh, uh, violent warrior, Carrying out what God commanded him to do, it wasn't sinful in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with that, but that that, that was not his mission. His mission wasn't to build the temple. His mission was to secure the nation and to expand its borders. Uh, often people get confused on that when they read God saying that, that he was not uh, going to allow him to build a temple because he was a man of war. The, the impact there is that was God's purpose for David. His purpose for David was not to build a temple. His purpose for David was to be the warrior. His purpose for Solomon was to build a temple. That's how God's plan worked. And so what we see is, is how David is struck by the magnanimous grace and generosity of God beyond any other family in the earth. It is his family, his his descendants who will secure the salvation of, of the world, one descendant, and that will be the Messiah. And he clearly understands that. And he is just uh, almost speechless at how this could take place. So we're looking at David's thanksgiving 
And I want us to think also about this as a way in which David is claiming the promise of the covenant. He is mixing his faith with the word of God. God has specifically promised him certain things, which we're going to talk about. And in the midst of that, when we get down to verse uh, 27, where David says, "For you, O you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant. That's the covenant. Have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build your house. And then David says, therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And the prayer to him is that God would do what he promised to do. That's the faith rest drill, is that we take a promise of God and we pray to God that he will do what this promise says that he will do. So we looked in the previous part of this chapter at what the Bible teaches about the Davidic covenant. We saw its significance here. We saw how it was related to the Abrahamic covenant. It's related to the Abrahamic covenant both in terms of land because there's uh, references within the Davidic covenant that, uh, for example, in verse 10, where God says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. That's related to the land promise in the Abrahamic covenant as well as the land covenant itself. So there's a connection there to two prior covenants. And then he is going to talk about the seed that uh, his descendant, that God is going to bless. And that too reminds us that it is through the seed of Abraham, as we concluded last time, that God is going to bless all mankind through the one individual, uh, the Messiah. The Abrahamic covenant, I, I hope you can say this in your sleep. When we finished Genesis some years ago, I think everybody could lip sync with me, land, seed, and blessing. Goal of teaching is to teach you so you won't ever forget it, not just make it memorable. We're not about entertainment, but learning. Land, seed, and blessing, each one of those expanded by three other covenants. These are not the theological covenants that you find in covenant theology, which was a rationalistic system imposed on Scripture. The covenants in that system are the, are the covenants of works, covenants of grace, and in some cases it's called, the, there's a third called the covenant of redemption. None of those are explained or talked about anywhere in the Bible. They are just rationales that were generated uh, totally apart from scriptural revelation and then imposed on the text, which has a lot of negative implications uh, in Bible study and gave birth to the whole uh, uh, covenant theology within Reformed theology. So the middle one, the seed promise, is expanded in the Davidic covenant, which, like the Abrahamic covenant, has three dimensions to it, a promise of an eternal house, not an eternal building. It's a play on words because in both Hebrew and probably in English, because of the Bible, the establishing a house means to establish a dynasty. It is an emphasis on family lineage and that God is going to keep that family going uh, to fulfill certain promises. So there is a promise of an eternal dynasty. It had ups, it had downs, it had people in it that were uh, obedient to the Lord and it had more that were disobedient to the Lord it was eventually, um, it appeared eventually to have been uh, wiped out uh, with the exile, but that was alluded to in the imagery of the stump of Jesse that we saw in passages uh, like Isaiah 11, 1 and following uh, last week, that it has the appearance of being ended, but then a branch comes forth from it. That branch is a picture of the Messiah, a descendant 
from that stump of Jesse, David's father. It's an eternal kingdom that involves people and it involves land. You can't have a kingdom without three things. You have to have a king, you have to have people, and you have to have uh, land with borders. You can't have a kingdom if you don't have borders. Borders are, de- are established by God, actually, according to uh, Paul in Acts chapter 14. And an eternal throne. Eternal throne has to do with an eternal ruler. It's, a, it's metaphoric in the sense that it relates to the one who sits on the throne. And so these three elements establish an eternal covenant with David. And so at the end of chapter seven, uh, that part of chapter 7, the end of the covenant, God gives a summary statement which is quite significant. He says, but my mercy shall not depart from him. The him is the seed the promised seed of the uh, of the covenant and he says um, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I removed from before you so there's a hint there of and a reminder that God had necessarily removed Saul from the kingship because of his disobedience but he said, told David he would not uh, remove uh, David uh, or his family from the from the throne, but there's a warning in this that there will be discipline. For in uh, verse 14, God said in reference to the seed, which here refers to a fallen person who would sin, and that would be Solomon. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. In other words, God would use the instrumentality of human armies, uh, the military of various nations, as he had promised in the five stages of discipline to bring uh, a judgment against Israel. So he says, my mercy, and the word there for mercy is the word at the bottom of the screen, one that is not uh, foreign to us. It is the Hebrew word chesed. Uh, incidentally, that's also the root that, go, that is behind the uh, term chesedic or chesedim, and that refers to them as the faithful ones. And so chesed has the idea, it's translated as mercy, it's uh, not the standard word for mercy. It's translated loving kindness. It's translated uh, some other ways. It is a covenant love. Only God has true chesed. He is loyal to his covenant. And that's what, what he states here. My faithful, loyal love shall not depart from him. God will be true to his covenant even if... Uh, Solomon or the other human descendants of David are not true to the covenant. It will be true that there will come one who is both human and divine, the Messiah, and he, of course, will not be disobedient to the Father. And the Father's love will always abide on him, as we learn from the Gospel of John. But here the focus is on the fact that God's loyal love is going to stick with the house of David. And that's what we see as we go through the uh, various kings of Judah. We discover various satanic attempts to destroy the line of David. We can think of uh, Athaliah, who is the daughter of Jezebel, and she sought to slaughter, indeed slaughtered all but one of the sons of the king. So he was hidden away by the high priest, and brought forth when he was of age, and then uh, she was killed. She was executed for her idolatry and for her um, uh, murder uh, of the of the Davidic household. And then there was the attempt by the northern kingdom uh, and the uh, uh, king of, of Damascus of Aramea to destroy. Ahaz, we read about that when we did the study on 
um, Isaiah chapter 7. And God gave a special sign to Ahaz and to the house of David that they would not be destroyed. So God was faithful to his covenant. And then he says in verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. You referring to David. His house and the kingdom. That's where we get those first two terms I have laid out in the chart. And your throne shall be established forever. So twice it is stated that these three will be established forever. And so there is a, an eternal covenant that is established here on the order of the eternal covenant that God made, uh, made with Abraham. And so that brings us to this next section of the, uh, of, of the chapter where David responds to God in verse, uh, verse 18. And in verse 18, we come to his, his prayer that he is going to come to God in a special prayer and it is set up in a unique way. I want you to note that there is the episode that we have just finished where Nathan comes to inform David of what God revealed to him, that he is giving this special covenant to him. And David does not immediately respond to God. Some little time goes by before David responds to God. We read at the beginning of verse 18, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. Now there's a couple of interesting things that are going on here. First of all, so, there would have been preparation. The text doesn't make an issue out of it, but there would have been preparation for this worship because he's going into the temporary uh, tent that he has built for the housing of the ark until the temple is built. And in order to go into that presence, we know from all of the ritual that we see in the Mosaic Law that he would have had to have brought sacrifices, he would have had to have been spiritually cleansed and prepared to go before the Lord. He's not just going to walk straight in there and sit down before the Ark of the Covenant. A second thing that we see is that he is sitting this is the only time in Scripture that someone has a posture of sitting in prayer. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, we will uh, talk about that a little bit when we get there. But that just sets the stage. For what we see when we teach about prayer is that there are four different elements to prayer that are important for us to, to remember that prayer has these four aspects. Each of them alone can be a prayer, and all of them together can be a prayer. You can have two present for a prayer. You can have three present for a prayer. You can have all four present for a prayer. And I use the acronym of CATS, C-A-T-S, to teach about these four parts of prayer. The first is confession. The A is for adoration or praise. The T is for thanksgiving, which this prayer is a combination of thanksgiving, but it is also a, a prayer, a supplication to God to do what he's promised to do. And that's the fourth part, that is the, the supplication. Now, I want to say a little bit about this. The foundation of all prayer is spiritual cleansing. Without spiritual cleansing, we can't go into the presence of the Lord. As David says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard, and what that word means in the, in the Hebrew is if I look at sin in my life. And Paul talks about examine yourselves. That's the same idea. It's that we take, take we stop, we do a little self-evaluation, and we determine if we have sinned. Now, for some of us, that may be quicker to do a quicker project than for others, but we take a little self-evaluation. 
Now, we can't do this all the time, but too often, I think, that we probably uh, stick it into high gear, speed through this so we can get to a prayer that is really what we want to talk to God about. And yet, if you examine the rituals related to cleansing in the Old Testament, they were not something you hurried through. And what happens when we hurry through reflecting upon whether there is sin in our life or not is that we have this sense of minimizing the significance of sin. Now, I'm not talking about spending a lot of time wallowing in guilt that, and just self-absorption and, and focusing on our failures. That's not the point. The point is to, it's a exercise in reminding ourselves that we are sinners. And the impact is to humble ourselves under the authority of God. One of the ways in which we see this happen in this passage is the language that David uses throughout this prayer is language that focuses on God as the Lord God, which he says over and over again, O Lord God, in, in verse 18. And in fact, uh, I'll get down to this a little later on, but there's eight times in this prayer of 12 verses that he addresses God as Yahweh Adonai, which emphasizes the authority of God. And then, on top of that, David is going to refer to himself 11 times as your servant. So he puts himself into a position where he recognizes and emphasizes his role as serving God. I think sometimes, and we're all guilty of this, that we sort of slip into a mode where prayer is a way in which God becomes our servant to do what we'd like for him to do. We need God get involved in this and clean things up a little bit. And uh, we may not think that overtly, but we sort of slip into that uh, inadvertently. I think within the name it, claim it heresy in the uh, crazy matic movement is that they actually teach this that you tell God what you want to do and you dictate terms to them and that is its own uh, that's its own problem but in confession what we're doing is we're taking time to reflect upon the fact that we have sinned we have violated God's will we have violated God's character we have we have been disobedient to his word all sin is sin that is against God we cannot sin against another person now sin may involve something egregious secondarily against a person but if we define sin as doing something that violates God's character then by definition you can only sin against God you can't sin against somebody else because it's not their rule that is being violated. It's not their character that's being violated. It is God's character. So when we see an example of confession in the Old Testament, David's confession, we'll look at the text in detail after we get through the sin with Bathsheba, uh, David confesses and he says, "'For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He is conscious of. Now, we all know that there are some sins that we do that are pretty egregious, and they may shock us when we do them, and they may shock other people when we commit them. And so we are more cognizant of them. And then there are those sins that, if we're honest, we're just really comfortable with. They've been with us ever since we were kids, and they're part of our personality. I often wonder that when we get to heaven and the sin nature is not there anymore, what is our personality really going to be like? Because a lot of our personalities are shaped by our areas, uh, our area of weakness in terms of our sin nature and our arrogance and our self-absorption. So uh, some sins, though, we're very cognizant of, and then David says in verse 4, against you, you only, have I sinned. Now think about that. When he commits adultery with Bathsheba, he sins against her in one sense. I mean, he's violating her. He's violating Uriah. Uh, he's trying to cover it up. He gets um, 
uh, Joab involved in the whole thing. I mean, it's just a mess. All kinds of people are involved in, in his sin and his cover-up. But he says, it's only against you, God, that I've sinned because it's God's law, God's character that has been, uh, that has been violated. And so uh, we have to think and pause, no breastbeating, not self-flagellation, but a conscientiousness about our sin. Not to, not to the extent that we're dwelling on it overtly. That has its own problems. Then we may start enjoying it a little bit. Uh, but in the sense that we don't just run through a rapid grocery list as if the destination is on the other end. If that makes sense to you. So it is part of the process. I think also that sometimes people get the idea that, that they just name or identify their sins. They just sort of run through this list, and it isn't personal. But when we look at examples of confession in the Scriptures, it's personal. It is an admission of disobedience, an admission of guilt, an admission that I have done something that has... Uh, violated God's righteousness. I have been arrogant, I have been angry, I have been bitter, I have lusted for the details of life as if they would satisfy me and make me happy instead of you. That's a form of idolatry. Uh, that's the kind of language we find in the, script, in the Scripture. And when we address this, it reinforces in our mental attitude that we are not worthy to come into the presence of God, and it reinforces, or should reinforce, our grace orientation. What a wonderful thing it is that when I confess sin, that I am reminded that I'm not worthy of a single thing that I have. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for that sin, and because of that, I am cleansed, and that should humble us, not humiliate us, humble us. And we have seen in our word studies on humility that the, Moses was the greatest man in the Old Testament, the most humble man in the Old Testament, and that has to do with submission to authority. And so uh, that sets the stage. It's not emphasized in our text, but for David to go in and sit before the Lord, uh, before the Ark of the Covenant, there would have had to have been sin offerings, there would have been burnt offerings, there would have been thanksgiving offerings, and now he is going to sit before the Ark of the Covenant, and he is going to bring this prayer uh, to God. And so he begins by focusing in this prayer on his own insignificance in relation to who God is. Verse 18, we read, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought us this far? And yet this is a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? How many times did he say, O Lord God? Three times. That's not mindless repetition. I've heard people sometimes, some young people, and they're trying to learn how to pray, and they'll repeat certain phrases over and over again. I had a friend of mine, when I was, he was a camp, camper, and I was a counselor at Camp Penile, and every fifth word was, O Lord. And it got tiresome after a while. And, and, but that was just the way he talked. Eventually he grew up and got out of that. But um, sort of like somebody saying y'all, or you know, rather, saying you know every fourth or fifth word, you know? And you know, you get tired of you know, somebody always saying you know. Every time I would say you know when I was a teenager, my mother would immediately jump on me and say, no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't, until you were just so embarrassed that you had to clean up your act because you couldn't ever talk about anything if you said it wrong. That's called good parental training. Anyhow, 
So what we have here is David recognizing his total unworthiness, his total, uh, his, his total submission to God, and he's just stunned that God has given him this incredible, awesome gift. And as I pointed out a minute ago, he uses this phrase, Adonai Yahweh. Adonai is simply the phrase for Lord recognizing a senior person. In its more informal sense, you might say it's equivalent to uh, English speakers who use the word sir to address somebody in, in authority. But at another level, it goes much beyond that, that he is recognizing the ultimate, the one who is in ultimate authority in the universe. Now, there are some translations that translate this, O Sovereign Lord. That's not a translation, because no word for sovereignty is here. That is an interpretation. And that is their interpretation, and that it goes beyond a strict translation. So he uses this phrase, and if you look at the text, you can see it. When you have the lowercase Lord, that is Adonai. And then when you have uppercase G-O-D or uppercase L-O-R-D, that reflects the sacred tetragrammaton, the four letters Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, the personal name of God. And so we have... Uh, four times here where he uses the personal name of God, Yahweh, and uh, three of those times it is connected with Adonai, indicating his submission to God's, uh, God's authority. And this is used some eight times in, uh, in this section. And then also he uses a second phrase, in the middle of this section, twice, he uses the phrase Lord of Hosts. And there it is, Yahweh Sabaoth. Sabaoth is a plural. The O-T at the end is a, is a feminine plural. And this is the Lord of Armies. The Lord, Hosts is just an ancient, antiquated English word for armies. So he is Yahweh, the commander of the armies of heaven, and he oversees, actually, the armies of men. No kingdom can win in a war uh, without uh, the permission of God. Two times in verses 26 and 27, he uses the phrase, Yahweh Tzabaoth. And then, as David refers to himself throughout this section, 11 times he refers to himself as your servant. That isn't just a polite form of address. He's emphasizing this, especially in light of the fact that God has given him this royal grant type of covenant where he is rewarding a faithful servant. And so David recognizes. That's why the text says that David's a man after God's own heart, that despite all of his sin and failure, which is no different from all of your sin and failure and all of my sin and failure, that with all of his sin and failure, his, what, the passion of his soul was to serve God, even though he failed. And that's going to be true of all of us. And every now and then you hear uh, people on the national stage who understand nothing about grace and they understand nothing about Christianity, and they want to make some issue out of some Christian sin. I don't care about some Christian sin. We all have sins. Some of our sins are more obvious than other people's sins. But what matters is, in our heart of hearts, do we have a passion to do what God wants us to do? Do we ultimately want to serve the Lord? And that's what God meant when he was talking about David as a man after God's own heart. He desired to serve God. And so we see that coming out in this prayer as again and again he refers to himself as uh, your servant. So as we see this also in the text, there is... Um, there, there's a just an interesting little thing in the Hebrew. The Masoretic text uh, puts a, a vowel point under the N, 
See, it's the, the consonants are olive, which is sort of a soft guttural, you know, almost unpronounceable. It's like the beginning of saying the letter O. Okay, when you say O, oh, you feel it in your throat as you start to say that. That's like what the letter Aleph is. It's not an A, it's that, that little glottal stop just before you say the word O. Oh. And so uh, you have Aleph and then Dalit, which is a D, and Nun, which is an N, and then Yod, which is a Y. But when the Masoretes put vowel points in there, they put a uh, comets under the noon, which looks like a, it looks like a cross where the crossbar is at the top. It looks like a little t, capital T, and but that means one thing, that would indicate a plural, a plural uh, of majesty, and so it would be translated more as some have sovereign God, but if it's as it's, as it's put in some manuscripts, as apparently the Septuagint translates from, it, just a dot instead of that little t, then it would make it a, uh, a personal, my God, my Lord God, which is how I think it should be translated. David is making this personal. He is talking about, who am I, my Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? He's very personal and intimate in the way that he is addressing God. Those vowel points were not in the original, and they were put in by the Masoretes. And sometimes you have to, when there are differences between other ancient texts, like the Septuagint and some others, uh, you compare those, and if you have two or more that co are uh, contrary to the Masoretic text, well, then you probably have a problem at the Masoretic text. That's not what I was taught at Dallas. I've learned that since. I learned that from uh, Michael Rydelnik. I learned that from a Jewish scholar named Emmanuel Tove and some others. Uh, Dallas and the typical standard approach to textual criticism in the Old Testament is if the Masoretic text says it, that that's the way it should be. But often they change the vowels to take out messianic implications in some other verses, and we studied that in, in, other, in other studies. So David says, who am I, my Lord God, and what is my house, that is, what is my family or dynasty, that you have brought me this far? And in verse 8 and 9, as God introduces the covenant that he is going to make with David, he says, now therefore, speaking to uh, the prophet, he says, now therefore, Nathan, thus shall you say to my servant David. Notice how God addresses David as his servant. That's a high honor. Thus says Yahweh Tzabaoth, thus says the Lord of armies, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. God is omniscient, he, but this is more than that. He has watched over and protected David. He says, I have cut off all your enemies before you. He's given him victory over all of his enemies and have made you a great name. You are famous among all the peoples of the earth. Now, that's what David means when he says, who am I that you have brought me this far? You have brought me from the sheepfold up to the palace. You have brought me from being a shepherd to being a king. You have taken me from being a shepherd boy whose only weapon was a sling and a, and a shepherd's staff to being the commander of a mighty victorious army that has expanded the borders of the kingdom. And then as David reflects on this, he says, and yet this was a small thing in your sight. What he recognizes here is that the big problems that you and I face are really minuscule in the sight of God compared to his omnipotence, compared to his abilities to deal with us. He is bigger than any problem you face, and he's bigger than any uh, challenge that you're going to face in life. 
God has given us the skills to depend upon him so that he can level out those mountains and he can open the doors that seem shut to us. So David says, this was just a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. That's the second thing he points out. You've not only made this promise for me and my immediate son, but you have made this promise for generations to come. Uh, In fact, for eternity. You have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. And then we get into something really gnarly. It's translated in the New King James, Is this the manner of man, O Lord? So, before we get into that phrase, I want to go back to one thing, and that is just to talk a little bit about our posture in prayer. David is sitting before the Lord, as I said. He is, uh, this is the only place in Scripture where someone takes a sitting posture in prayer. That is not the only uh, posture that is stated in Scripture. Another thing about this prayer, this is the third longest prayer in the Old Testament. So this is a significant prayer. And David is, is uh, sitting before the Lord, and, and I really can't explain why he is taking this posture. But prayer posture is a funny thing, because I think people get all caught up in their posture and how people might see them in their posture rather than the mental attitude of submission. And so in Scripture, when we look at Scripture, we see that there are people who have all sorts of different postures. Some are standing. Some have their eyes directed toward heaven. Sometimes they extend their hands and their arms toward heaven. And sometimes they lie down prostrate before the Lord. Sometimes they are kneeling. There is no prescribed posture. Now, it became popular in the charismatic movement to pray with your arms extended. And I used to joke around a lot about, well, you have the people who are really serious about God, and their arms are all the way out, palms out. But, they, you know, and they'll say, well, that's what they did in the Bible. No, it isn't. What they did in the Bible is they held their arms up and their palms were faced toward them. Oh, well, I'm going to be more holy and I'm going to do that. Then there's others who, uh, they're not quite as devoted, and they just hold one hand up. Sometimes it's a little lower. Sometimes it's like this. I don't understand any of that because they're putting an emphasis on posture as if somehow that relates to the significance of the prayer or how God will answer the prayer. And It was cultural in the Middle East, not just among Jews, but among others, to take a position where you would, in some cases, extend their arms and their hands in beseeching a god or an idol or anyone. It was cultural. It wasn't ever mandated or prescribed in Scripture. A lot of times what you have is passages where the person simply bows their head and worship. Genesis 24, you have Abraham's servant uh, Eleazar going to look for a wife for Isaac. And as he leaves and goes on his mission in verse 26, the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Just simple. Let him say he closed his eyes. He just bowed his head. Uh, verse 48, and I bowed my head. This is Eleazar speaking. I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham. And then in verse 52, as it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord bowing himself to the earth. So he went all the way down prostrate on the ground as did Moses in Exodus 34, 8. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Now, none of these are prescribed. They just express the internal desire of the person uh, at the time. So this is not something that people should get wrapped up about, and yet you find different Christians who do, and I guess they always will. I'm going to pray more significantly than you pray. 
And as Jesus told the Pharisees, it's better for somebody to go into their private chamber and pray rather than to be seen by men. And I'm always amazed at how many people, sort of Christians, ignore a lot of the things that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount about privacy. You know, when you give, don't let anybody pay attention to your giving. Don't do it in a way where people are going to know what you give or how much you give. It's not something that you're going to show off about. Uh, when you pray, uh, don't make a show about it. This is what the Pharisees did. They made a big deal about uh, wanting everybody to know that they were uh, that they were pious and that they were praying and that they were very devoted to the Lord rather than making it uh, something that was only between them and the Lord because he's the only one ultimately that mattered. So prayer can be done while you're driving down the freeway with your eyes open, preferably. It can be done when you're lying in bed, going to sleep at night, and, and I can't imagine the innumerable Christians that fall asleep in the middle of prayer. The Lord must, sometimes I chuckle, that Lord, you just have such a great sense of humor. How many people get halfway through their opening, opening prayer and they go right to sleep? And that's happened to me many, many times, and I'm sure it's happened to you as well. And there are other times when uh, we pray and we're in public, and that means that public prayer should be targeted to their purpose and not about everything else under the sun, and uh, <coughs> that this is our opportunity to communicate with the Lord. Now, the last phrase in verse 19 is difficult to translate. I haven't read a commentary or a translation that translates it the same way as another. And this is from men who are real scholars in Hebrew. It is just extremely difficult. The New King James translates it, Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And in the NET, it translates it, is this your usual way of dealing with men, O Lord God? In fact, in their note, they say, and this is the law of man. That's how the King James translates it. The New American Bible translates it, is this the manner of man, O Lord God? The New Revised Standard Version translates it, um, this too you have shown to man. Another translation, may this be instruction for the people, O Lord God. And they comment, the part of this, ver this part of th this verse is very enigmatic. No completely satisfying solution has yet been suggested. The present translation tries to make sense of the Masoretic text by understanding the phrase as a question that underscores the uniqueness of God's dealings with David as described here. The parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 7. 1917 reads differently. Now that's really interesting because everything else in the parallel passage is the same except for this clause. And that reads, you have revealed to me what men long to know, O God. So, passing on because I don't have a clue what that is saying, we'll go to verse 20. And David concludes this section by saying, now what more can David say to you? For you, O oh Lord God, know your servant. I, 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 I can't say anything else. I can't expand on this. I, I'm just amazed at your generosity to me. And then in verse 21, and this is a significant uh, passage here. In verse 21, David says, For your word's sake and according to your own heart. He says two things there. He says, for your word's sake. In other words, on the basis of what you have communicated, on the basis of your revelation, on the basis of your, your promise, as it were, and according to your own heart. In other words, he's appealing to the integrity of God's character. You have done all these great things to make your servant know them. He's not saying, wow, I can't believe I earned this. He can't, he's not saying, I can't believe I did something to get such favor. He's recognizing it that it has absolutely nothing to do with him. It's all about the plan of God, the promise of God, and the integrity and character 
of God. And so he draws a conclusion in verse 22, and he says, Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. Now, what's interesting is the word that is translated great here is a verb, gadal, which means you are magnified. That's how it's usually translated. You are magnified uh, with that, with that sense. And it, you find it often used in the Psalms. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. And then he emphasizes the uniqueness, the distinctiveness. This is a great definition of what it means that God is holy. For there is none like you. There's nothing like you. Nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now this has been a steady emphasis throughout the Torah, throughout the law, and on into the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 104.1 we read, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. Same language except the addition of of the uh, of very. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Notice it's extolling the character of God. Psalm 48, 1, great is the Lord, or magnified is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. So, and this goes back to passages in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 3.24, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your magnificence, your, and your mighty hand, your power. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? There's none like you, God. That's just a, a, a more expanded way of saying it. Deuteronomy 4.34, to you it was shown, that's Moses speaking to the people, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other beside him. God is one of a kind. He is unique. He is holy. That's what holy means. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders, and then Hannah in her psalm of thanksgiving and praise to God in 1 Samuel 2.2 2, after uh, the birth of Samuel says, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Well, then we come to verse 23. And in verse 23, this is the longest verse, but the focus of it is that God has a plan and purpose for Israel. And that plan was most clearly seen at the Exodus event. And that is when God redeemed the nation. He bought them, he purchased them, he gave them freedom, liberated them from slavery in Egypt. And so he now focuses on who is like your people, because he's been promised an, an eternal dynasty that's going to rule over these people. Who is like your people, like Israel, like the, the, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for himself a name. That's a word we studied Sunday morning, pada, which emphasizes God's work of purchasing a people through a substitutionary sacrifice. It's done uh, through the lamb at the tenth plague, the lamb that was without spot or blemish, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> And to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed, that is, you purchased for yourself from Egypt, the nations, and their gods. Short form, you redeemed them from slavery in Egypt to the Egyptians, to the government, and to the idols. And then David says, for you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. Who, this has never happened in history. You have a special relationship with Israel. You've made them special people. You are their Lord. And you are their Lord. You've become their God. So this is a great reminder of what God promised. Jeremiah 11.4 reminds us of the same thing. God is speaking, he says, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, obey my voice and do according to all that I command, so shall you be my people and I will be your God. So David fits what has happened to him within the context of the redemption out of Egypt, 
the giving of the Mosaic law, the making of Israel the special nation of God with their own special law, and that is fit within the broader context of the Abrahamic covenant that promised a special people who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then in verse 25 we read, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So, see, this is the prayer request. This is where we, we've had the, the praise, the focus, the thanksgiving, and now it is the claiming the promise. He says, do as you have spoken. You've made this promise to me, now, now do it. No, don't cut us off like you did with the house of Saul. Uh, there'd never been a promise like this to the house of Saul, but he is saying, now fulfill this promise. Establish it forever and do as you said. Verse 26, so let your name be magnified forever. This will bring glory to you. It will show how great you are. It's the same word there, magnified, gadol, which was translated as, as uh, great earlier. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, Yahweh of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. So that's what he's doing. Notice how he is repeating to God what God has promised. God promised that the house of David would be established forever. And so now David is just stating that back to God, do what you said you would do. Why? Verse 27, for you, O Yahweh Tzabaoth, you, O Lord of the armies, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servants. Literally, you have uh, made this known, or you have, uh, you have disclosed this to the ear of your servant. It's an idiom for revelation. You have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. So he's, he's repeating back to God what God has promised. That's how we claim a promise. And we talked about, this is what you promised, God. Now I'm calling upon you in these circumstances to apply the, that promise to my set of circumstances. And so David concludes in verse 27, Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, in verse 28, you are God, and your words are true. And you have promised this goodness to your servant. See, in this section, what he is doing is he's setting something up, and he's saying, you're God. And second, your words are true. And third, you have promised this goodness. You have spoken, literally, you have spoken this goodness. It is not a word for promise, it is, but that's the implication. You have spoken this goodness, this grace to you. So he talks about the Lord's words are truth. He says that the Lord has promised these good things to David. And so his conclusion then is to bless the house of his servant by fulfilling his promise. That is the conclusion. And so when we come to the end of this section, we see how David has humbled himself under the mighty hand of God, and God will exalt him. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study through this section, David's prayer with lots of implications for how we pray, how we express our gratitude to you, how we claim promises that you have made to us. Father, we pray that you would help us to be better students of the word, reading it on a regular basis, being reminded of the promises, memorizing promises, claiming them on a moment-by-moment -moment basis that you might be glorified and that we might see you work in our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.